Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Museum of the American Indian. My name is Keevan Lewis, and I'm the outreach coordinator here that oversees the museum's artist leadership program. Today, we have four great national and international artists here from Canada, the United States, and, P and Peru. They are here in Washington, D.C., conducting research in the Smithsonian's collections in preparation of their planned community projects to work with kids in their community or with other artists back at home. The program offers an incredible personal and artistic experience that often reconnects artists to the indigenous cultural material for inspiration, discovery, and a challenge to their own personal boundaries. But before we begin uh, today's program, and as a cur courtesy to the people you're sitting next to, you might want to turn off all those little computer gadgets. I call them gadgets. <laughs> and please note that today's event is globally live webcasted. And you'll be able to uh, view this uh, recording after, after we finish here at 3.30. So today, like I said, we have four gifted and recognized artists whose background is in literature, performance arts, textile, and urban graffiti. I think that will enlighten, inspire, and challenge our, our thoughts and our beliefs. So please welcome Aymar. Sarah, Maria, Bobby, and our moderator. We do have a moderator for you, so you won't be having to listen to me all the time, but uh, Rebecca Troutman. And they're here for this discussion titled, Bringing It Home. Artists re Reconnecting Cultural Heritage with Community, a theme that is at the very core and heart of the NMAI's Artist Leadership Program. So please welcome Rebecca Troutman. Thank you, Keevan, um, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this artist panel. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for being here for this discussion with the 2012 Artist Leadership Program participants. Um, I, my name is Rebecca Troutman and I'm a curatorial researcher here at the museum. I've been here for about nine years and I work with our contemporary art collection and exhibitions. Um, I've been very fortunate this week, um, the past week, to get to spend time with these four artists. And in addition to being incredibly smart, talented and creative artists, they're also really nice people and a lot of fun and so I'm looking forward to our discussion. The title of this program, as Keevan mentioned, is Bringing It Home, Artists Reconnecting Cultural Heritage and Community. The Artist Leadership Program, as Keevan also stated, is an opportunity for artists to spend time in the collection, uh, in the collections both here and at other Smithsonian museums and archives, to study and to really reconnect with objects and historical photographs and documents from their communities, informing and inspiring their work. Each artist participating in the program also commits to organizing either a workshop or a public art project um, in his or her home community as a way of bringing this experience and the knowledge gained back home. We'll begin the program with each artist presenting and discussing his or her work. This will be followed by a discussion among the artists about their research, uh, the role of home and community in their work, and their planned community projects. There will be time in the second part of the program for questions from the audience, so we'd appreciate you holding your questions for the artists until then. So the first artist who I'll introduce is uh, Maria Hupfield. Maria Hupfield is a multidisciplinary artist working in performance, sculpture, and other media, and living in Brooklyn, New York. She is of Anishinaabe, or Ojibwe descent, a heritage, and a member of the Wasaksing First Nation. She's re researching cultural material, audio recordings, and photographs of Anishinaabe origin from the Georgian Bay Woodlands of Ontario, Canada. Please welcome Maria Hepfield. All right. Well, thank you for coming out. Um, 
Ani Bojo Wabazi Kwen and Dej Nakaz Wabajin Dodem with Saksi Natonjaba. I'd like to introduce myself in this way that I was taught um, by my Ojibwe language teacher in university when I was taking Anishinaabe 101. Um, I, I find when I introduce myself in this way that it reminds me of where I come from and who I am, my clan, my nation. Uh, so I am a Canadian artist living in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm also an artist educator. So I've worked at Emily Carr University of Art and Design where I was basically finding ways and strategies to indigenize the institution, to put us at the same level so that all the students, are, all of our cultures and all of our nations were represented and embedded within the curriculum that was currently there in the art program. I'm also uh, a founding coordinator of a program called Seventh Generation Image Makers, which was a mural and video program when I was a youth myself. So working with my, my friends living in Toronto to find ways to take what I was learning in the classroom and apply it to the community. So while I'm here, I'm looking at objects from my community and thinking of, of taking those objects back to my home hometown Perry Sound, at, and going to the high school, so Perry Sound Public High School, where there's five different reserves, and all those reserves are bused in and they attend the high school. And there's also the non-native, or the other students, um, and the other native students who live off reserve, they also come in. And so I'll be working with them in the cultural language class and sharing my research, my art practice, and helping them to kind of connect these two pieces and thinking about what is it, what is the value for these youth living in Perry Sound, in rural Perry Sound, the Georgian Bay Great Lakes region, for them to, Ontario, Canada, to be dealing with and discovering and working with their language and also with these objects that come from their communities here in the museums. So I really want them to be able to discover their own artistic practices, their own creative process, and respond to those objects and, and, to, and to my work. So there's sort of a mentorship that's also happening because I'm a graduate of the school. I'll be working with a video team, and they're also one of the, my videographer, he's also, a gra he also attended Perry Sound High School. So there's these levels and layers of thinking, if I go back and think about if I, when I was a youth and I was in high school, what would it have been like to have someone from my community living in Brooklyn who was an artist come in and talk to me? So I'm going to share some of my work with you. As I said, I'm from Georgian Bay region originally. Um, and I come from a family of makers. My dad's a boat builder. And so the first boat I built, I had a grant through the Ontario Arts Council. And I made this canoe. And so you might be wondering, why is the canoe through the gallery wall? Well, first of all, where I grew up, every woman sort of, you know, it's kind of like every good woman needs her own boat. So this was my own boat. And being an artist, it went through the gallery wall. So I guess if you think, you know, you don't want to rock the boat, this is one thing that could potentially happen, right? I really rocked it. Um, and also, I remember going to the McMichael collection in Kleinberg as a, a child and going with my grandmother and seeing these paintings which were done by these landscape painters who would come from Toronto to Perry Sound and paint the landscape and then they'd go back to their studios in Toronto and they were gorgeous and I would see these paintings and I'd be like wow they're really great that's my rock that's my tree that's my water that's where I'm from only I wouldn't be in the image. So you can see me painted in the corner, connected, my silhouette crouching, holding a crown, you know, thinking about that monarchy, because in Canada we still have a queen. And also these ideas of for an indigenous woman, you know, you have two stereotypes. You have the Indian squaw, or you have the Indian princess, and either way, there's two representations that, you know, who can relate to those. So thinking about craft and honoring sort of this idea of things needing to be functional, having a purpose, um, I made this, this piece in sort of early days of my career uh, and really wanting to honor the stories that were coming from our own people, not just criticizing, saying, oh, these guys got it all wrong, these other guys, but having our own voice. And so this was the first jingle dress that I made 
for, for myself. And one of the things that strikes me about it every time I look at it is how quiet it is. And sort of feeling like, you know, I want to shake it. I want to wear it. It should be danced. Um, and so in that wanting to wake it up, feeling like no matter, sometimes no matter how loud I scream, who's listening? You know, if you write a book, does that mean someone will read it? How can we make that information relevant and meaningful to everyone so that, yeah, they will um, hear us, not just with the way they're used to hearing, but to hear us the way that we need to be heard. heard. So part of that discussion then for me comes back to, is it important that someone knows what a jingle dress is? what it means to embody sound, to feel healing. Well, I think everyone can kind of relate to the idea of, of the sound when you hear it. Or I remember a woman once looking at that dress and telling me it was beautiful because it reminded her of many trumpets. And I thought, yeah, that's awesome. Or how people would say, look at it and say, well, are those bells? And I'd be like, well, it's like a bell, but there's no hammer. So it can't make no noise on its own. It needs each other. So really wanting to embody that sound. So I made these jingle boots, and I ran back and forth and up and down. And I just wanted to run and do all these things. So the image here, survival and other acts of defiance, is basically me jumping up and down. And then I've looped it, so I'm never giving up. I'm always going, like the Energizer Bunny. Um, and then here, this is work that I've completed for an exhibition at that started at the Museum of Art and Design called Changing Hands. And when I was invited to participate, I was so excited because it was all about my area, the, you know, sort of the eastern woodlands. And the title excited me because it was so much about the body, the hands, changing hands, like who, who gets to tell the story now? And so I came up with this piece where it's a video shot from above of me wearing these jingle boots, placing objects down, doing all these things that are coming from my body, this idea of being nomadic and caring who you are, having that in your bones, moving through the world no matter where you go, but still being connected to place. So you see this video, but then you also see the objects from the video. And then you also see the place that I stand, which is the floral motif. And from there, I've started to think also about performance. So including my body, what does that mean when you're standing in front of someone? You're the one who's in control. They can't ignore you if you're there. And so with this work, I'm, you, know, you see me laying. I'm the one who's laying down the line now. And when I have that spotlight up there for some, it's just a spotlight. For me, it's the moon. It's grandmother moon. Uh, for this performance, I was look, it's called Fixed Time. I was looking at, I wanted to reference something other than just performance art. So I went back to this idea of storytelling, our own oral tradition. What do our storytellers do? What are their strategies? And I've incorporated them. I'm not a storyteller, but I am a visual artist. I use my body, you know, in the way some people use paint. And so my actions are really important in this way. So I had to think about those strategies. What I, are they? And it was the first time I used my voice, because usually I'm silent. My actions usually, usually speak louder. So I had to really you know, think about what those words would be. And it became, by the end, I went through these actions. And at the end, I had these beautiful jingle gloves that I pulled out. And I wore them. And I thought, that makes sense, because I'm a maker. And I work with my hands. The other part about being from uh, culture that's outside of this Western canon. So if we think of what Western art is about, it comes from Greek and Roman. It comes from this origin that's from another continent. And I wanted to reference what was here, what's part of this bigger conversation. Um, and so when I look at the art history and what I want to include in the art history, I'm starting to look at a tradition that's very inclusive and has many other elements. Um, music, dance, all of these. And so sometimes, I'm, well, I'm not a musician, I'm not a dancer, so I need to work with people who have those talents and can bring it forward. So here I'm working with musician Laura Ortman, and she's fabulous because she's ex an experimental um, musician, so she was sampling my materials and she gave them a voice. She set them to this, her own composition. She composed it, and it plays 
There's a video that we made, the stairwell outside of my studio provided the structure and I'm moving through it in my jingle boots and we perform live over top of this. So she's performing live with this traditional violin but she's making these sounds and this music and it's beautiful. So I think of her using contemporary in, um, equipment but using it in a way that hasn't been done before because she's so cutting edge and I think our people have always had that whatever nation, we've always been really innovative, working with what was available to be cutting edge. So, whether it's a large format camera today or sculptures, these are some of those bones. So when I go back to my community, I'm really looking forward to working with those youth and thinking about how all these objects are, can kind of celebrate, you know, really knowing who we are and where we come from. Um, this is one of the objects that I discovered, which was an Ojibwe invitation quill. So thinking about, yeah, you know, one time this was a way to invite people to a feast, was to get one, receive one of these feathers. And so I think, wow, who would have thought? I wouldn't have known that. Or I've discovered this. We came across, you know, we open a drawer and there's this hair piece and it's all woven and I'm like oh it's Indian hair weave you know like we're wanting to understand that and know more about that um, so I'm just gonna end by saying I think with Native art especially here in Washington DC we're here at the Museum of the American Indian and wanting and right across the way is the National Gallery that those two should be in conversation and wanting to have why you know, not just stop here, but have our artists in that space as well, that we're really working to recognize and have recognition of our histories um, and including that. So, all right, thank you. Thank you, Maria. The second artist I'll introduce is Bobby Wilson. Bobby Wilson is an artist of Sisseton, Wapiton, Oyote, Oyate, or Dakota heritage, living in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's worked with aerosol paint to create numerous public murals in Minneapolis. He's also a graphic designer and a member of a, a sketch comedy troupe called the 1491s. He is researching Dakota quill work with a focus on floral adornment. So please welcome Bobby Wilson. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, let's see what's going on with this thing, huh? Please excuse us, world. I know there are people from many places watching us right now. So I'm going to put on my smooth voice for this. Hello and welcome. My name is Bobby Wilson. I'm Sisituan, Wachbetuan, Dakota. I grew up in the Twin Cities. I was born in South Minneapolis, and I currently reside in St. Paul. I am a muralist, among many other things. Here I would just like to focus on the visual aspects of my work. Behind me is a piece that I painted at the Catherine E. Nash Gallery in Minneapolis, Minnesota, entitled Wichachbe Wichasha, or the star man waiting in the sky, because I listened to a lot of David Bowie, especially during the time that I painted this piece. Never gets old for the folks that have seen this presentation already. <laughs> My work began primarily as a graffiti artist, which became a, a large act of teenage rebellion and, um, and just a good way to, to let off some steam, I suppose. So. In this slide, there are three pieces that I have painted in my life. One is underneath a bridge, one is on top of a bridge, and the other is on a delivery truck. 
Two of them were in Minneapolis. One of them is in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, as they call it there. That was a lot of fun. There is absolutely nothing about this work, though, that suggests that an American Indian person did it, which is funny because my ethnic identity and cultural identity define much of what I do with my life and also a lot of the, the content of my work. This is a piece that got third place in the Iron Lack World Competition. This is also the only piece that won in the United States. This was painted by myself, an artist by the name of Andres Guzman, and Jordan Hamilton on Intermedia Arts in South Minneapolis. The signatures are inherent within the mural, and you can find them throughout the wall. On the top left, underneath where it says Intermedia Arts, and on top of the drunken green hobo, it says D-U-E-S, which was my signature. Below him, it says B-E-I-N-G, and below that in the water, it says A-D-E-P-T, and those are our signatures. But that comes from the graffiti culture. But graffiti isn't really my culture, now is it? I have a long, rich history of a tribe that comes from Minnesota that has been there for thousands of years before I was born. So that culture and that time and that place informs the work that I create now. This is from a mural in South Minneapolis on what's now called the American Indian Cultural Corridor, which was coined by the Native American Community Development Institute, which also sponsored the mural that I'm showing you right now. Part of that sponsorship also allowed for me to have high school students and a college student not only gain school credit, but also receive a small stipend for working on this mural with me. Uh, the bottom left photo shows uh, Daniel Yang, who is a member of the Native American Community Development Institute that helped get this funding together, as well as the community members that this mural highlights, because a lot of art that ends up being portraiture, I have found, become memorial pieces for someone who did things with their life, but is now passed. This, these are people that were able to actually see themselves painted on their community. On the bottom right is a local drum group from the Little Earth of United Tribes housing projects that were invited to come by and share their work for a community gathering celebrating the wall and the work that we did. Part of this work also builds community for the young people. I've been telling a lot of folks that in a lot of ways when you walk around your neighborhood and you see buildings that don't reflect your personal experience, it can really help to keep down, and I say help like it's a positive thing, but a lot of that keeps the community at a certain level where they know that they aren't, their culture and heritage and history have absolutely nothing to do with the buildings that are there, at least in a positive way. To be able to change your surroundings, to reflect your own aesthetic, can be really important to building the self-esteem of a community, and I hold that as a firm belief. It also helps build community by working with young people who now may have not in their lives been able to meet each other and work with each other on a project like this, but now they're gonna have this memory for the rest of their lives and be able to support each other in their future endeavors. Whether or not it's art, that's fine. This is more than just art. It goes into uh, community building and um, just able to, to complete a task. They, a lot of these guys came in there and said that they can't draw, and so they didn't know what they were gonna do. Well, I showed them that it takes more than just drawing. It takes a lot of measuring and hard work and weed pulling and cleaning and, uh, it takes a lot. You gotta coordinate these walls. So, moving on from that, the work that I'm doing out here, the overall goal in this project is to create another community mural in Minneapolis. But I'm here to research the floral patterns and adornments of my tribe because there's a very great selection of them at the CRC in Maryland. 
this piece that I'm showing you right now is a 10 foot by 10 foot, I guess sculpture you might want to call it. It's just skateboards, long boards actually, made of wood that I've painted on to resemble pieces that you might actually find in those collections. This is a bit of a self-portrait called Pejuta Mato on one of those skateboards. I'm going to go ahead and let you all interpret that for yourselves while you soak it in. And if you have any questions about it, you can either email them in or you can ask me if you happen to be present. This is another piece that uh, is informed by tribal aesthetic entitled Sinte Sapila, which was my father's name. Uh, this is gouache on paper. One of my favorite artists is Oscar Howe, and he used a lot of gouache. And if you look at a lot of the work that came out of Oklahoma, you're going to see a lot of gouache too, which I, can get, I get a lot of influence from, from my Oklahomies. This is another piece in that same genre called Mastincha. Now, I know this doesn't look like graffiti. This looks a lot more Indianish. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a fusion of the two. This is a hand drum entitled Wachi Wichasha, or the Dancing Man. It's about 24 inches by 24 inches, circular, obviously. But this is a mixture of not just graffiti, but also a, an image of a teepee with a prayer coming out of it. I'm going to let you soak it in for just a second there. I know there's a lot to take in on this piece because it's just that deep. There you go, there's a couple smiles. I also make a living as a graphic designer through a company called Buffalo Nickel Creative. This is a vector image of the piece in the center of this drum. You can see it kind of pop up there. So I'm able to vectorize these old images and sort of reappropriate them for my own purposes. And in a lot of ways, the reason that I do these things is because uh, American Indian owned businesses and companies um, and organizations have a tendency to seek out graphic designers who are uh, either not qualified for the positions that they, that they take or they are not native owned. So if you do not have a personal connection to the aesthetics that you're pushing out there, it's my belief that it's not, it's just not going to feel right, you know? It's going to be a lot different. It's just going to be a picture. Whereas if you really do some research and check out what that means and you kind of grow up with that, then I think it can speak to you on a different level. And it can inform the, the illustration that we do. It can, it can completely change the way that we that we digitize our art nowadays, especially for web design and graphic design. These are all different uh, vector and raster files that I'm showing you right now. So Pidamaya, and thank you for coming out and having a peek at some of the work that I do. Okay, um, our third artist is Aymar Kopakati. He's an artist of Aymara, de, and Aymara and U.S. heritage living in Peru who works in sculpture, collage, and Aymara textile traditions using contemporary materials, including plastic bags. He is researching textiles and other objects from the region of Puno, Peru, with a focus on the area around Lake Titicaca. So please welcome Aymar Kopakati. Good afternoon, everybody. Kamisaraki, Askeurupana. 
Nansu Teha Imarko Pakati Satatwa. It's a little bit of uh, my name and a welcoming to all you all in my language of Aymara. And we'll see how this works. All right. So um, I learned to weave when I was 14, 15 years old from my grandmother um, in Peru. This is a, the first slide is a, a tr traditional drop spindle, um, but using a plastic refuse. So um, I learned in a very traditional way uh, the techniques and the philosophies behind that. Um, so it took me a while to be able to <coughs> use that weaving um, integrated into my, into my uh, contemporary art. But it eventually did happen. Um, it was kind of after uh, my grandmother passed away and a lot of soul searching where I said I'd rather this tradition be alive because if I learned to weave for my grandmother for any particular reason, it was so that at least during my lifetime, the weaving tradition in my immediate family wouldn't die because my uh, two uh, cousins, female cousins, did not learn how to weave and I did. Um, so it's obviously something that um, may disappear, it's in decline. We'll see how far it goes, but that's why I'm, I'm working. And other people are also working on preservation. Um, my type of preservation is a little strange because I'm kind of <clears throat> making modern kind of strange uh, mutations of weaving. Um, this is a uh, plastic knitting that I started experimenting with um, <clears throat> in 2010, 2011. Uh, I enjoy sharing the process. I, I enjoy making weaving and knitting a didactic kind of thing where people who might be worried about how technical and scary it can seem can see that it's much, it can be a lot more simple than we might think. Um, in 2010, I, I started exploring the vast new landfill. Um, we've really only gotten this invasion of plastic bags and as a, as a pollutant in the last uh, 10 years or so. Before that, everything was a lot more natural in the Altiplano around Puno, southern Peru. There was uh, just, plastic, uh, just glass bottles and, and um, they had deposits. Um, now the plastic bags are everywhere, so I started picking through those plastic bags, sorting them out by color, and knitting with them. Um, I was knitting uh, a giant chulio, which is our traditional ear flap hat. Um, and in the most traditional of the communities, there's still an idea that these hats, certain versions of these hats will be worn by a community leader, um, someone who has achieved, you know, all the, the, the smaller um, responsibilities in the community. And when they reach a certain age and all this, they, they take over on a, different, um, on a different level of responsibility with the community as an elder. So I made this hat uh, during election year in Peru, and my idea was that we need to pick a new leader. So I was kind of playing off the, the notion of, of the hats in our tradition. Uh, this is about 12 feet high and four and a half feet wide. Um, it's a sculpture. <clears throat> I, li I like to, I like to um, amuse, bewilder, and shock uh, people in Peru um, with the material, with the technique, um, because we need a lot more uh, intercultural dynamic in Peru. We need a lot more uh, self-esteem in our communities. So um, it's kind of interesting to think of art as a hammer with which to shape the world we see. And I believe firmly that art uh, needs to uh, be visionary and guide forward in time. So this is a smaller version of the big hat. It's a miniature. Uh, made out of bread bags and uh, supermarket bags. That was something I started experimenting with um, <clears throat> that eventually led me to this next thing, which was uh, working with my community. It's an ongoing thing that I just began really this year um, on an offhanded idea. I asked some of my aunts in the community if they would replicate some of these things I was knitting, miniatures. Um, they got kind of shy and said, well, uh, we think that people are going to be teasing us. So we're going to make these in secret um, because uh, we're very practical people and everything has to have like its traditional purpose and we're used to working with yarn and with fiber, animal fiber and 
all of this. So cutting up plastic bags to knit into these hats is like a very new thing. Um, they surprised me. They made a lot more than I thought they might make. I kind of thought they might dislike the process, but you know, all in all, they got pretty obsessed with it. So um, if anyone's interested after the conference, I have uh, samples of that work that's for sale. And also I'm trying to get them on Amazon. And so all you out there in the internet world could purchase a native uh, keychain made by uh, women in Lake Titicaca knitters. Um, so that's really an interesting project for me because it's combining several different things about my community, um, uh, working with them, the, the ties to the community, the fact that the weaving came to me from my grandmother, the idea of uh, using it in, in, in my uh, contemporary art came from my grandmother because she would make plastic uh, rope for her sheep. Um, and my father's also a metal sculptor. So he works with recycled material also. This is another project I began, which kind of goes into the more um, social aspects of being an artist. Um, I began a video project in 2011, um, thanks to a year-long residency in Lima, to investigate uh, you know, how you make videos, to think about how that would fit into an educational curriculum. Um, we did uh, short workshops in the high school and the grade school in my community. Um, at the end of the presentation, there's a link there about, of, the, uh, of the video project where you can see the videos. They're all uh, done in our Aymara language. Um, the idea is that we have um, material available in our language that we start to, you know, someday we need to have uh, newscasts in our language and soap operas and anything else that any other people in the world have. Um, the idea is to maintain our language and therefore all our culture. Uh, this is my father and, and I um, at an art show in Lima. Um, my father is a big influence in my life, as was my grandmother. Um, he works with recycled material, as I mentioned. And his lifelong dream was to build a library uh, in our community in Lake Titicaca. So uh, he's been building this out of pocket. Um, we're looking at it now that it could also be a cultural center and house some of the projects I've been working on with language, uh, you know, language strengthening and uh, video stuff. Um, you know, I've been also roped into um, reappropriating uh, free so software, Linux software, and all this, and putting native languages in there um, as an educational idea for children to be able to learn to read and write in their own language, because many indigenous languages are oral tradition and they're not written. That doesn't mean they're not written now, because we've been uh, going at this for the last 500 years now, so a lot of our languages now have a written form, and I believe it's very important for our written languages to be used um, in the modern context. So one idea about all of these uh, seemingly unrelated or somewhat related things I'm working on is to start a nonprofit or look for um, a way in which all of these projects can continue to be pushed forward and delegating responsibilities and um, making it a larger, larger process. So I'm going to play a quick video that shows the weaving technique. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. And while it's going, uh, I'll explain a little bit about the work um, I'll be doing in Peru with the, with the young people and the weavers and basically I have to identify who really um, can participate and who would uh, get the most benefit um, of spending time with me and uh, <clears throat> seeing all that I was able to see here in the Smithsonian of our textile traditions. Um, and basically we'll be working on a large scale um, Andean flag. It's our communal traditional flag is the Wipala. It's uh, the colors of the rainbow in squares. So we'll be collecting plastic trash out of the environment and um, probably using a mixture of knitting and weaving to make a large scale piece um, with all the colors. So it'll be pretty interesting and a lot of fun to see how they react. Because um, so far I've only shown my work, but I haven't yet shared the process in a, commu in a community setting. Uh, so that'll be a really, really interesting thing to do. Um, some of the interesting things I've found in the, t in the collections are uh, hats 
for the the single young women in the community before they get married and when they're uh, little children also. Um, some of those were collected by an Adventist missionary who brought us reading and writing because uh, the Catholics wouldn't do that. Catholic Church, shame on you if you're out there. <laughs> so we learned how to read and write around 1920. Um, I'm the great-grandson of, of a man who, uh, Luisito Tintaya, who gave up his native ancient traditions with coca ceremony and many, many different uh, old knowledge that we had so that his grandson, my father, could learn to read and write. So it's really important for us to be here in this collection, seeing these ancient things, seeing things from the 1920s, you know, connecting back to when someone uh, from the United States named uh, Stahl came to Peru and actually came to my community and showed up and brought us the Bible and reading and writing. Um, and to think that now in the 21st century, maybe 100 years later, we're uh, reclaiming our traditional uh, ceremonies and things that were always important to us uh, while at the same time having reading and writing. This is my aunt. She thinks I've gone crazy. <laughs> I got a little bit of a, of a, of a wake-up call. And she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Since then, they've gotten a little more used to me than they were rent when I filmed this. <laughs> I filmed this in about 2007 when I was first experimenting. <laughs> so this is all on YouTube. I've got a bunch of videos on there of things I've made as a way to share with the world. So... That's the assumption I go on is what if someday there's no fiber left and we're just uh, drowning under excessive amounts of plastic. In my world, we continue to weave no matter what. <laughs> this is about a week-long process, uh, handily squished down into five minutes. And the spinning and the collection of the trash and setting up the traditional loom. Um, this is traditionally a woman's loom. The men's loom is actually a bolt cloth loom where you actually sit. But um, I did it this way because it's, it's, it's a lot more exact. It's kind of a lot more um, maybe hours because the, span, uh, the, the, te the bolt cloth loom is a lot more uh, Western, Western minded in technique. So I'll go back quickly to the PowerPoint. On current slide. Yeah. Okay, so this is um, a recent ex um, exhibition I had in New London, Connecticut, um, in collaboration with a, a, um, an artist residency named I Park up in northern Connecticut. <coughs> Everywhere I go where I uh, have a show, I build a loom. As I said before, I like to share knitting and weaving as, a, as an accessible experience so that people can um, not be afraid of it, put it into its context. Um, we all wear clothes, the, the whole world. At some point, um, modernity was created after the Industrial Revolution, was which was created on textiles. So for me, textiles um, has always been an invention and an exploration, um, kind of between different cultures. Uh, this is some work I've begun recently. Um, using the plastic bag for its colors and creating more visual paintings. I call it painting with plastic because I'm really fascinated by the colors um, and, and the chance to get out of the really tight weaving um, is kind of liberating to me to just do visual things. So I do both. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Imar. And our fourth artist is Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer. Sarah is a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and she's an author and storyteller living in Canton, Texas. 
Her research focuses on early 19th century Choctaw cultural materials and historical documents connected to the removal and the pre and post removal periods. Please welcome Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer. Yeah. Halito, my name is Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer. As Rebecca said, I am a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, but I actually grew up in East Texas. That's my home, born, bred, fed, be dead a Texan. But I will say my second home is definitely Oklahoma. I spent a lot of years up there, a lot of my growing up years, going to our Trail of Tears commemorative walk, attending the Labor Day Festival. We have a, a huge festival at our uh, Capitol grounds at Tuscoma and uh, it's gone into now over a week-long uh, celebration that we have. This is, um, I'm not a visual artist, so I don't have a lot of pictures of my art. My art's mostly written and in doing, doing storytelling. This is actually one of my favorite activities, sitting and listening to elders tell their stories. This is at the Choctaw Elder Circle uh, at the Five Tribes Story Conference in Muskogee, Oklahoma that I go to every year. And uh, there in the middle is Tim Tingle, one of our foremost Choctaw author, uh, storytellers and authors, and one of my mentors. But just sitting there listening to the stories, uh, this lady on the far left, she told her a boarding school story of her time at Wheelock Academy. And just sitting there listening to all of these stories and thinking about their history and their legacy, it just brings to mind, I just wonder who, who is writing these stories down? Who, who are they passing these stories on to? Who is going to tell their stories to the next generation? What's being done to preserve them? This is one of my favorite ladies right here on the right. It's my great aunt Evelyn who lives in Durant, Oklahoma. And there she is with um, photo albums that she saved. She saved my grandfather, which was her baby brother, his baby picture, and also their father's baby picture. We have so, so many treasures in, in this photo album with photos over 100 years old, and she has all the captions. She has the stories written down to go with these photos, and she actually passed that on to us just recently. She's in assisted living home now. This is also at the Five Tribe Story Conference where I did a storytelling this last uh, September. I'm the baby of the group there. This lady here on the left is my inspiration. I wasn't raised in the Choctaw culture, but my mom, Linda Kay Sawyer, is the one who passed that down. We always had somebody each generation who kept that thread alive of our Choctaw ancestry and the, the pride of being Choctaw. And she is the one who has inspired me to do the stories, to tell the stories that I do and to write them. This is at our Trail of Tears commemorative walk there at our, our Capitol grounds in Tushkoma. We've done a lot of research trips in collecting stuff to make these stories as accurate as possible, especially with our family history. This is in Mississippi, in our homelands. Our family, uh, the Roebucks, actually lived on this island. They called it Honey Island because Ezekiel Roebuck Jr. had a bee farm, bee, uh, beehive farm there, and his wife, Elsie Beams Roebuck, was also called the Little Blue Hen, and she, had, she raised geese. Um, this is the home that they left during after the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek was signed and the removal process began of moving the Choctaws, um, the forced removal of moving the Choctaws from their homelands of Mississippi to Indian Territory. Uh, one of the boy that lived on that island, island, William Roebuck, was 12 years old during the removal in the Trail of Tears and he and his younger brother and baby sister and their mother buried their father, Ezekiel Roebuck, along the trail uh, after, during, during the removal. He died of cholera. And this is actually William Roebuck's, one of my great-grandfathers. It's his headstone. Um, he was, like I said, he was 12 years old during the removal, and we found the family cemetery in Oklahoma, and that's, that's where he is buried. This is a quote from one of the stories that I wrote. It was actually just published this month in December 
uh, in the Book Fund magazine. It's an online digital magazine. You can just Google it, Book Fund magazine. It's a free subscription. You can sign up. But I have a column in there called Choctaw Spirit, and I write articles. Uh, this last month was about our Choctaw powwow, and this month was one, um, or the title of it was just Hunger. And I based it on the Trail of Tears, the, um, one of the, the stories of a, a woman who had her children and, you know, having to put them to bed hungry um, when they didn't have enough food. And then I fast forward the story about 15 years to the Irish potato famine. And during that time, the, you know, United States was taking up collections and the Choctaw Nation collected $710. And this was just about 15 years after their own Holocaust and the, the removal from their homelands. And they, they gathered, the, they took up a collection and sent it to Ireland. And today we still have the Irish that come over and walk the Trail of Tears with us in commemoration. Why am I here in DC getting to hang out with cool people like Callie out at the Cultural Resource Center? I also went out to the Congressional Cemetery and found Chief Pushmataha's um, monument where he's buried there and Peter Pitchlin, those were Choctaw chiefs. I am working on a short story collection with my community. That's gonna be my community workshop and the title of it at this time is Touch My Tears and we're focusing on removal stories and that time period pre-removal and removal. I'm going to be teaching an advanced writing workshop for Choctaw authors in Durant, Oklahoma. So I'm here collecting sensory details, actually getting to hold these objects up close and examine them and just absorb the emotions and the stories that come with these objects. This is another one of my big inspirations. This is my dad. And whenever I first started talking very seriously about you know, the importance of preserving legacy and preserving family stories, it really inspired him. And he had a lot of negative stuff in his, in his childhood, but he started writing the, the happy memories. He called it for the good times, and he would post those on Facebook. And, uh, and on uh, August 26th, he passed. Um, of this year and it was actually two days later that Keevan called and said I was accepted into this artist leadership program. So he's definitely been an inspiration especially the last few months as I've been preparing for this trip and and for my workshop of the importance of preserving those stories because you don't know when they when they will be lost. I just want to leave y'all with this quote uh, by Jack Pajez that's kind of one of my missions because I love oral storytelling it's a, still a very strong tradition in the Choctaw Nation but I'm also focused on getting those stories written down. And it says the weakest ink lasts longer than the most powerful memory. And that's definitely one of my missions is capturing these stories in an entertaining form where people want to read them, but still staying uh, true to the spirit of the story. Here's a couple of places you can find me online, choctawspirit.blogspot.com. Uh, Sarah Elizabeth Wrights is my main site. And then on Facebook. I want to thank everybody and especially thank you Keevan for organizing this phenomenal artist leadership program. Thank you. Yaku Ki. Check, check. Check. Yeah, I just... Can you hear me, Mark? Check. Is this on? Thank you. What a beautiful view. Thank you.
we're going to start being our true selves. I do care. <laughs> okay, thank you to all of the artists for those presentations. Um, now I have some questions I'd like to ask each of you, and there will be time for the audience to ask questions as well. And as I believe Keevan mentioned, people watching the webcast can also email questions in, and we'll ask those as well. So, um, so I'd like to start by asking you all to think about community and home, since that's such an essential part of this program. Um, I think it's really interesting that this year we have two U.S. artists, two artists who are from outside of the U.S. but have close connections to the U.S. and have dual citizenship, both of you, I believe, one from Canada and one from Peru. Um, whom, whom do you consider your community to, to be and where is home? And do you, do you have more than one home? Each of you seems to have a very different relationship to home. You um, may live part of the time in your home community and part of the time away. Or, um, you know, Bobby, for you, it seems to be the, really the, the um, inner uh, kind of the, the pan-tribal community of Minneapolis. Um, so I'd just like to ask you to be to talk a little bit about where your home is and who your community is. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> for me, home is the Twin Cities. That's where I grew up. That's where I was born and raised, and hopefully someday I'll die there. <laughs> No, I, I could die anywhere, I guess, and that'd be all right. I don't have much say in that. Um, a lot of people that I talk to, a lot of Native people that I talk to, associate home with their reservation, which is perfectly acceptable. I'm not going to knock it for even a second, because home is absolutely a relative thing. A lot of folks ask me if I go home very often, and I say, well, yes, I go home almost every day, at least when I'm not out of town. So... My connection is to Minneapolis and St. Paul because that's where I was born and that's where all of the people that I grew up with still see me to this day. Um, okay, so home. Um, I, my immediate, there's so many, so many things. I mean, I think I move through many different communities. I have many circles of communities, the artist community, the performance artist community, um, the Anishinaabe community, the larger contemporary Native art community. I, you know, it's just so many people who I could say. Um, there's a group I'm working with at MoMA called The Hour right now, and we go back and look at, collection, at the collections, and we're looking at objects that deal with feminism. So, you know, there's another community there. So, uh, immediately, home, home is with my immediate family. It's with my partner, with my child. That's wherever they are, that's my home. But I was also, you know, we all kind of live in different situations, and I grew up in one region, so that region has affected me greatly. That's, that would be, you know, where my mom, my mother's home community is. And so, living there, that's definitely shaped how I see the world. And I often think that the values and the things I learned growing up are completely in opposition to the reality of what I deal with day to day in Brooklyn about, you know, money and going and there's a different pace. Um, so those are sorts of, you know, things that I, I guess I think about in terms of, of home. Um, yep, I was born in Peru and I left when I was two years old and came to the States, and I didn't go back till I was 10. Um, so, for me, I was born on an airplane somewhere between Peru and America, North, North America, because anytime I'm in Peru, they say, you know, we're Americans too. <laughs> so, that's just a word for, for all my, my friends back home. Um, I do a lot of back and forth. Um, I long ago realized that the best thing I could do with my life was to become a bridge for my people between the new and the, and the old worlds we live in. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a good long process of, um, you know, I think, I think my first language may have been English from my mother, but I know I also um, hung out with my grandmother until I was about three or f when I came to the States. Uh, so I, I learned Aymara when I was 10, and my last language is Spanish. So um, it's interesting because sometimes I speak Spanish with an Aymara accent and people think I, people get confused because I don't look necessarily prototypically Aymara. Um, the more time I spend in my community, the more I realize it was important to also leave. Um, because 
you have to be able to bring things back to the community. The community is there and uh, the world they live in there in the community is agricultural. Um, the educational system of Peru is horrible, so we're about you know five generations into that. They're trying to end us extra officially, of course. Um, so I, I learned at some point that uh, coming and going was definitely for me the ideal place for me to be because the ideas I share um, with my family and my friends there in the community um, are at their best when when I'm uh, approaching new things or showing them new things, but it's from me, so it's okay. I mean, it's a strange dynamic. I'm the only uh, mixed person in the community, so um, it's a pretty uh, it's a it's a life of extremes. Um, we need we need in the community to learn new things. Um, I think so. Uh, you know, and unlearn old things. And you know, it's this big process, but. Um, you know, when I stayed too long there, I kind of just started thinking like everybody else. And in, if I start thinking like everybody else, then I'm going to get mad at people from the city. And, you know, there's a lot of negative things that start happening when you're in a traditional community, unfortunately. I mean, it's, I'm just going to say it, you know, it's the product of the 500 years of uh, cultural strain and stress of being a conquered peoples, you know, in a world that uh, thinks differently than you. So, um it's like you need to bring light to there. I mean, it, it, in my situation with my community, I've noticed that they've gotten very good at, you know, keeping the world out. But, but then what do they do when they're just amongst themselves? They kind of, you know, just start forgetting from within about uh, really important things. So, so I, I, I consider myself a breath of fresh air. Um, and it's always real interesting. So, so I think that point of friction is, in my case, really important, the relationship between me and my community. Ditto. <laughs> Actually, what, what Maria said, home is, is where family is, and that's always been my thing for sure. I grew up in Texas, but most of my family on my mom's side was from Oklahoma. And they ended up in Texas was my grandfather, my papa, whenever he was a boy, his mother left and she moved to Fort Worth, Texas. And when his, uh, when his father died, his oldest sister, my aunt, great aunt Evelyn, took over raising the two youngest siblings. And whenever, their, um, whenever my papa got to, I think, 11th grade, he moved down to Fort Worth to be with his mom. So that's how we ended up in Texas but we still have very strong connections to southeast Oklahoma, the uh, ten and a half Choctaw counties there. And like I said, always going up there a lot, that's where our health care was <laughs> with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. We have our own health care system and it's it's phenomenal. But it's it's where family is. I have five brothers, they're all all in Texas, some some down towards South Texas, some further east Texas, and I know my mom's three sons, those three brothers, there's, there's always this kind of pull to Oklahoma. We, have, we all have this, this strong connection. I know two of them have always said, you know, I'd like to go back, I'd like to go back to Oklahoma. But the big thing is, is where, where our family is and where my family is. And as we've been getting more and more back into the Choctaw culture and meeting more people, we're finding more family in Oklahoma. And so I'm like a lot of you, I'm kind of split between, between Texas and, and Oklahoma. So I would say both of those are my home and they're both my communities. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about how your work is connected to or how it draws from or responds to your home or your community. What, your, what the relationship between your artwork or your writing is to your home and your community. Well, as you saw in my presentation, Rebecca, my work is my community. Uh, it's on my community and it is helping grow my community. That's really a part of the work. I'd say that the community work is part of the artwork and vice versa. Both work off each other and neither can, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say that, but I don't think the work can survive without the community personally because uh, it, 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 would, it, would, it wouldn't mean the same thing that it does right now. It would just be writings on a wall 
or a, or a picture on a wall. But the fact that there are people who can grow up and hopefully someday show their kids, hey, I painted that a long time ago when I was your age, I think that says something pretty cool. Okay. Well, I, I guess my, I don't know if this is gonna really answer the question, but I'm interested in community and how I'm interested in community specifically in the research I'm doing and the project I'm doing here at the Smithsonian is that I want to, um, I want my community to know what I do. So for a long time, my dad would call me a painter because in my undergrad I took painting. And so I think I've come up, you know, it's not really what I do today. Uh, so I think they need to know what I'm doing and I need to share that with them. So there, there's that aspect of wanting my community, very much like what you were saying about it has to be going back and forth. You know, we can't be having conversations with ourselves all the time. We also have to communicate with the rest of the world and show the rest of the world why we are, what we have to say is, you know, every bit as good <laughs> and worth what else is going on. So that's what I think about in terms of the project. Uh, definitely, you know, I think I, <laughs> the cultural and the community aspects for me that are, um, a lot of that is very personal. It's not necessarily the first point of entry in my artwork, um, you know, and on another level, I can make something like Jingle Boots, where that seed comes from um, might be very personal, but that doesn't mean in the end project that everyone's gonna wanna hear about my experiences dancing growing up or what my personal story is. So I want to be relevant to everyone. So those are things that connect with my work in terms of when I'm thinking community. Yeah. And that way it might help build, build the community, expand, open ideas. Thank you. Um, yes, well, one thing Maria and I have in common is kind of um, being trapped in a modern contemporary art world um, and being native people it's kind of a strange thing because of a lot of our work is very conceptual and that's very so part of mine uh, you know the the best thing I did to help my people understand what I do is is having my aunts make these hats that they're making now like that's this one little thing that makes it practical for them what it is I do because as I always repeat, you know, in native communities all across the Americas and probably all across the world, art, technology, spirituality were always one thing. And this other idea of separating them into each, every, you know, I'm a painter, I'm a printmaker, I'm a sculptor, none of that existed. Everything was uh, for a practical purpose, even if it was a spiritual purpose, was also practical, you know, in that it would uh, stop the hail from falling on our crops or or give us abundance and fertility in our livestock. So that's why I'd carve a certain, um, you know, carving or, or certain image or all of that. So um, it's pretty difficult, uh, you know, in my community to, for example, in my case, to try to um, explain to them what I do. Um, so I, I, think, I think I'm very drawn to, you know, the idea that my... <laughs> that my artwork be flexible enough to serve as a vehicle for me expressing um, our life as Aymara and Lake Titicaca to the rest of the world when it's the context to do so. And otherwise, I'd like to uh, branch out from just being a native artist into um, other expressions or just be, be taken um, for what being an artist is. And then on the inverse of that, in the community, it's like doing practical things that help people, that help the community, that bring us together and bring us closer and get us communicating with each other. Um, you know, it's almost like it's a very different need of the expression, I think, in the context it's in. A few years ago, I was talking with our assistant chief, Gary Batten, and we were talking about, you know, the history and the, the culture of the Choctaw people and a lot even with our within our tribe a, a lot was lost uh, through through the generations especially in the the 60s and 70s a lot of our actual culture was lost so today you know just our our 
people in our tribe, the average, I wouldn't say the average, but a lot of them just aren't aware of a lot of our basic culture and history. And I know Gary Batten was saying that's something that they've been really uh, beefing up a lot of our culture programs and our language. We have a Choctaw School of Language now. And, but he was saying as far as like learning a lot of history and culture, he's not one that would sit down and read a history book, you know, about the Choctaw people, but he loves sitting down with a, a good story, you know, and, and reading and learning about our culture and our history through, through fiction. And, but that's, you know, historically accurate fiction. And so I would say with, with my community, that's something that I want to reach out to just a lot of Choctaws that aren't aware of our culture and our history and to teach them through just fiction just through entertaining stories but stories that are real and that have that have been passed down and you have to you know fabricate some things because we don't know absolutely every little thing and <laughs> every little thing but you know you you can put it in an entertaining form but still stay true to the history and that's something that that's close to my heart and um, that's what I want to reach the, the Choctaw, my Choctaw community with. Okay, and uh, now I'd like to ask each of you um, to talk a little bit about the time that you've spent doing research in collections here. And some of you talked more about this than others in your presentation, but um, what have you done and what have you seen? How has it met your expectations or has there been something that's really surprised you? I have to say that going into the collections has actually gone beyond my expectations. Working with a man named Thomas Evans at the CRC has been fantastic. He's shown me numerous pieces that I wouldn't have even thought to ask about. Uh, I came in there really knowing exactly what I wanted to find and specifically where from. But he was able to show me so far pieces that related to what I was looking at. And that even went further than that. I've, I, I got to look at Micmac quill boxes. And the artistry that's there is absolutely stunning. And I, I, I sent a picture to one of my good friends who does a lot of quill work. And I said, this is the next level. And it's funny because the next level happened 100 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it, it's been a really phenomenal experience uh, getting to go into the CRC and look at the collections there. I have a really good friend named Ben Gessner in the collections at the Minnesota Historical Society, and they have a really wonderful selection of pieces that, uh, that were taken either from punitive expeditions or they were taken as donations. Regardless of how they got there, we, they have a pretty good-sized collection, but it's really great to see what's in the CRC. And also the fact that they have a specific uh, smudge room. They have a room where you can go there and you can sage off and you can say a prayer or two before, you, before and after you head into the collections to handle a lot of those pieces because a lot of folks believe that there is a spirit attached to what's in there. And, you know, I want to make sure that I'm being respectful to the ancestors and the people who created those pieces originally and to make sure that nothing nothing crazy is sticking to me when I go home, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and is, is there anything you want to say, and this is a question for all of you also, is there anything you want to say about how what you've seen that surprised you, um, how, how, is, how is what you've seen going to impact your work, do you think? Oh, man. Obviously you can't you know, I, I, I reached this overload at the end of the week <laughs> where I had seen so many pieces that just, it blew my mind, and then I started to think, oh man, these guys, these, the, the people who created these pieces had this, un, this level of understanding that I just don't have. And it, I really thought, man, I really hope I can live up to all of this work. So I really needed to take a break, and Tom Evans made me some Oklahoma cowboy coffees, older Pawnee man, Vietnam veteran, and he really just sat me down and he said, well, you know, well, someday you're going to, you, a few months from now you're going to revisit this. Don't expect that you're going to have this big huge idea right now, but, you know, really think about it and really come back to it at another time. And when you least expect it, it's really going to hit you and your work is just going to change. And, you know, hopefully you stick to it. And I, I agree completely, you know, sometimes when you're fully immersed like that, it's, it's really difficult to think exactly what you want to achieve from there. I, I came in here with a plan to use some of this aesthetic to bring back into my community and to, to show everyone what it is that I learned and create a mural that is informed by those particular aesthetics. And now, 
Now I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I, I, I know what my plan is still, Keevan, just so you know. Don't rewrite my contract, okay? Yeah. I am here under contract, just so you know. <laughs> so I do have a plan that will still be executed in the time that I have allotted for myself. But beyond that, beyond this mural, I, I'm just really excited to see what comes from all of the information that I've gathered here on this trip and all the wonderful interactions and inspiration that I've been able to get from these wonderful artists to my left. Um, totally, totally, yeah. Um, I think no matter how much you prepare, no matter how much research and images online you look at, nothing can quite compare to like opening a drawer and seeing all this stuff. And you can't predict how you're going to feel, like whether it's emotional or, you know, like things that come, you know, carry so much. Like I was, and then really bizarre things, like. One of the things I, we came across, they said, oh, we have to show you the duck bills, the duck bills. And I'm like, okay. So we go, we look, and it's actual duck bills. And in them, they're like, for the children. And I look at, and there's like sugar candy in the duck bills that they would give to kids. And I'm like, whoa, like totally, like right there, a duck bill. So I think, I th yeah, when Keevan, we were saying that it felt like we're in school again, and Keevan said, well, yeah, the classroom is in the collection and really wanting for me and my project to bring that collection back into the classroom and have this real sense of ownership that being able to be in this program for me is like coming in and being like, yeah, this stuff is our stuff. This is, we should be in here. So as much as I come and look through the museum um, and the exhibitions, I'm like, okay, that's the surface. The real stuff is in the collection as well, like getting to bring and interact with it and I really, you know, I'd love to bring my whole community and just like all of us. And I don't, not just me, I want like my hand drum and group. I want them all to be, you know, from Wasoxy. I want them to come and sing a song with that drum that we see right there and these crazy little shakers I've never seen before. Uh, so I think it's inspiring in so many ways on so many levels, like to open a drawer and hear the sound of, you know, things going on in there. Uh, I would love to see the Smithsonian have an artist residency. I'd love to be making work while I'm here. Like so many ideas, so many projects I've been working on. I have like, I'm like, I don't have like one project now. I have like so many, like I don't feel like I have enough life in me in this lifetime or years to do all the stuff that I want to do since being here, so. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really inspirational to see these things. Um, Traditionally, our weaving would be um, tied to poles, kind of to make a, a doorway of sorts. This is way back, but um, the a little bit of the weaver always stays in the weaving. So, um, you know, just what Bobby was saying about about the spirits or <coughs> these things having life. Absolutely, they have life. Absolutely, they have life, and. Um, and and, it, and all this knowledge is in there, and all these codes are in there. Um, writing, our, our writing in the Andes, at least, was in the weaving. Um, everything means something, you know, as I'm sure many of us all have that, that type, that level of handwork, of craft, of technique in, in what was being made um, about the connection to, to our Mother Earth and the spirits and why we make and, and the reasons and for what purpose and all of that. So, I mean, I was able to find things, particularly from my area, um, that had the wrong labels on them. And, it, and in all fairness, when they hand you the PDF that says what the museum has, it says, do not assume that all the labels are correct. <laughs> and so, um, but you know, it was fascinating because I, I, I was uh, working with Veronica, who's from Ecuador. Um, she in, it works in the collections. and. Um, and um, and she's writing things down. And I'm like, yeah, that's from Bolivia. That's not from you know Puno or <laughs> this is from over here. And it was it was like this um, random knowledge that I have that I always assumed was kind of just really obscure. Um, and it was amazing to be here and 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 have it be of actual real value, you know. And 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 um, and they're just codes. And and being able to see that here is really really inspirational. Um, it goes into so many different levels, like I was speaking about before about the missionary that came with reading and writing, but yet came with the Bible. And so all this, 
all this stuff that we're still working through a hundred years later as a result of that. Um, it's going to be really interesting for all that I've documented is, is to bring it down there and and before I begin the workshops with, with, with the youths um, or the weavers or whoever I end up uh, getting, uh, getting to work with me on this, um, it's just going to be doing slideshows slide with a projector just like that. And, but you're just showing everything I found, everything I saw, um, where it is. I don't know, just that, that aspect of it is huge for us because most Native people in South America have absolutely no access to easy access to, to our own museums in Lima because you'd have to go all the way to Lima and when you're in Lima it's really expensive so the last thing you're going to do is go and pay 30 soles to get into a museum for a day. I mean, I, I hope and pray that programs like this uh, start to open the eyes of uh, museum people in Peru about, about opening the doors a little bit more. And, and I applaud, you know, Kevin, thank you so much and, and to the Museum of Smithsonian here to open the doors a little bit. I think it's a really one of a kind thing and and I hope other museums uh, follow suit. Y'all have opened the doors a lot. <laughs> a lot. Uh, yeah, as far as things that have surprised me or things that I'm not really going to talk a whole lot about, you know, we did get to see some sacred um, things that we didn't photograph and that was that was an experience at the anthropology. But wow, where do I begin? <laughs> it's this has been phenomenal. I mean, like, like they said, it's just, it's been unbelievable at the Cultural Resource Center to, to pull these objects and handle them. Because as a writer, it's, it's so critical to get those sensory details, to get the, the touch, feel, the smell, the, not just the sight. A picture's flat, you know, when you just see it in a, in a photograph or even see it under glass. But to handle it um, like the, the blowguns, I loved just just picking it up and just just feeling the balance of it. And I, I could find one today and look at it, but you know this is over a hundred years old and how they made them then, and to just just to to feel the balance of what it might have what it might have been like to use that, and oh wow today just just today um, we went to the National Archives and met with Jane Fitzgerald over there and she took us up in a secure vault that we weren't even allowed to take a picture of the, <laughs> the sign outside the vault. Only three people have access to this and she pulled out three uh, treaties for us, uh, Choctaw treaties. It was the Mount Dexter Treaty and the um, Dancing Rabbit Creek and Doak Stan. <laughs> That's one I always keep doing. But yeah, so Mount Dexter was first, then Doak Stan, and, I mean uh, Doak Stan Mount Dexter, and then J.C. Wright Creek. I have all these deals, but I was just so excited. I mean, when <laughs> it was just pulling it out, and one of the, the workers here at the, the mall, Colleen Thurston, went with us, and she's Choctaw. And just after the end, you know, we all got our pictures, and we got our, we got our video and stuff, and then we just kind of stood there a moment and just, you know, just on the verge of tears, just looking at these, these actual docu documents and the, the treaties, the, the Dancing Rabbit Creek was for the removal of the Choctaws from Mississippi to, to uh, Indian Territory. And just seeing those actual treaties, you know, not, not on microfilm, not on the internet, but the actual ones where they were signed, where our, our ancestors, our family, put their mark on those, on those treaties was, you're not gonna get that experience anywhere else. You're not gonna get those, those feelings. You're not gonna get that that sensation. I'm not going to be able to, I would not be able to write about those things the way I will now after having actually handled objects and seen them in person. And I can't wait for the rest of the stuff that we're going to see this week, but it's been unbelievable at the, at the CRC and at the MSC and, and here, uh, right here in DC. It's, it's incredible. And I'm just so thankful for this opportunity. Keevan, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, and I understand that this is the first time that, that the four of you have met, none of you had met each other before this, so I'm, I'm curious, have you discovered some connections among your work and your interests, spending time together? Um, I know many, many artist research programs in museums, artists go in individually and spend time by themselves doing research, and are, um, you know, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your experience 
getting to spend time with each other as you're, as you're going through this process. Um, there seem to be some interesting parallels among your work, um, although your work is all very, very different from one another. For example, Imar and Maria, both of you, um, in at least some of your work, are reinterpreting traditional forms, but in very different, very contemporary materials. And Sarah and Bobby, both of your work has strong connections, I think, to um, oral and visual narrative traditions. But again, you're working in very contemporary forms and telling very very contemporary stories, or, or sometimes very historical stories. So um, could you talk a little bit about the experience of, of spending time with each other and what kinds of connections or interests you found? Tell you one thing, we do like to eat and laugh quite a bit. <laughs> That's something we've got in common here. Yeah. <laughs> Who said careful? <laughs> no, it's... It, it's been fantastic, man. Uh, these guys have been just a blast to hang out with for the past week, week and a day now, you know. Originally, we're all like shy kids, you know, like, hey, hey, what's up? How's, how's it going? Uh, First 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. I, like, I like your hat, man. I like hats, too. Those are, that's cool. That's cool. But now we're like old friends just <laughs> hanging out, you know. I don't know. Uh, it, it's, it's, it was great because, honestly, I didn't know anything really about their work besides the stuff that I received in an email about the other artists who were uh, involved in this program. So uh, I really didn't know too much about what they were, what they were doing. But I knew that uh, with a lot of our talks that we had some, a lot of common interests uh, as far as community building is concerned. And creating artwork and then getting to actually see what it is that they've achieved in their lives and through their work. Man, that's some cool stuff. I'm, I'm kind of geeking on everybody else's projects, to be honest with you. So that's, that's what I have to say about it. Well, yeah, I, it's, it's really easy to get excited about everyone's projects here because there's, you know, being able to get to, to meet and know everyone. Um, I think the thing that happens often is with Native art is, and the term, you know, Indian and Native, First Nations, whatever it might be, is that it's sort of implying that we're all the same, but we're all very different nations. And so here, when we're together, we're coming from different places, but then there's like shared experience of Mr. Graduated from RISD and being in a contemporary art school, so we can really relate about things, or working with materials of, of our surroundings. So for me, industrial felt, for you, working with um, the consumer bag. But then also, like, here's this other person who knows, has a lot of similar um, cultural references. You know, so I think there's a lot of shared looks happening in discussions. And um, yeah, so many things about, you know, and then even like, oh, you know, just because we're women doesn't mean we have a lot in common. But then it's like, we have so much, right? Like, that can happen across our different areas. Uh, yeah, so I think the things that it, it's great whenever you're with other artists to also, you know, things, the urgency of things like economics or, you know, how important is that in community and commonalities that exist through a shared colonial history. So that's something that, for me, living in Brooklyn, it's great to be so self-indulgent to focus on that one area, um, whereas I, that's not the reality of what I get to look at when I'm in, you know, I'm thinking different things in Brooklyn. So, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's really interesting um, to have artists that come and spend the time together um, and learn from each other, be, you know, if it was just one at a time, we'd be kind of lost, we'd feel lost in a bureaucratic maze of some kind, you know, a little bit isolated from being a little bit crazy because we're not very good bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> so to have four of us here kind of helps open the space too a little bit and, and kind of absorbs a little bit the, the intrinsic uh, artistic craziness that can sometimes happen with inspiration. Um, you know, and, and I think, um, I think that, that that connection that we're all going to go, no matter where we live or how far or close we are to our communities, 
the point is they're there, they're out there, there are these places where we have uncle so-and-so and aunt so-and-so and, and they've known us since we were little kids and, um, and we know their kids or, or you know, we're going to go to their funerals or they're going to come to our, our weddings or all of, that, all of that connection at the end of the day is, is really um, a commonality um, and, you know, and I think sharing um, our ideas for how our work will go there, I mean, that's, that's one big commonality in all of our things is that we're going to go home and do a project with, with, our, with our communities um, and we're going to get to see it afterwards uh, on the internet, on video, and, you know, I can be sitting there with my community and show them what Bobby did, what Sarah did, what Maria did, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty neat. Yeah, that, that's one thing that I've been thinking about this whole time. Uh, one of the things is, you know, oh, I can't wait to get back and I'm going to show, you know, so-and-so the video of, you know, I marched up or Bobby or Maria and, you know, I'm going to show them, you know, what they're doing. And I think that's a big theme. One, one big theme that we, we all have as artists is we're, we're doing the art for us, for ourselves, but it goes way beyond that. You know, we all have a mission and we all have purpose in the art that we're doing. We're not just doing it just just for us, you know, this is our private little thing, you know, I mean, some of it is, it is very personal and it is just for you, but a lot of it, you know, y'all are so involved in your community and it's not just about you, it's about your community and about, about uh, your culture. And so that's, that's a big thing um, that I see as a, as a common theme with us. I actually didn't know we were going to get to hang out together <laughs> so much, you know, I thought, you know, everybody's going to be doing their little, their little research thing and this one's going to be over here and researching and all. But uh, getting all of us getting to hang out last Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday pretty much the whole, the whole time and just having fun getting ready for these presentations and, and doing all of this and, uh, yeah, a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, Keevan's laughing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Memories. Um, and just, yeah, just all the stories that I'm going to get to take back just from this trip of, of you guys. Um, because if, if uh, yeah, if, if I'm president, you know, you've pretty much given me permission to write your story. <laughs> I'm going to get a t-shirt on that. It's going to be my contract t-shirt, Keevan. <laughs> if you can read this, you've given me permission to share your story. <laughs> oh, but there's, there's been, been a lot of laughs and just a lot of fun and uh, a lot of commonness. Yeah, we've got some stories on Keevan, too. <laughs> But anyway, it's, it's been good, and I think, I think that's a, a big common thing with us is just our laughter and then sharing each other's purpose and our, our missions, you know, and the, the value of our art. I, I just wanted to add as well that there really is strength in numbers, and when you're, you know, if you're in your community doing your thing, realizing that there's other, you know, there might be these other people in other communities um, doing, who are fighting sort of the same battles. Or if you're in school, you're like the only Native student in your class. Or, you know, and re then realizing, oh my goodness, this woman was doing the exact same thing or this person the exact same thing on another part of the country. So I think being able to get together, and uh, that's really important because it's such a big continent, you know, all of the Americas, and being able to get together and not letting the, the borders divide us either to be able to say, yeah, we, we are indigenous peoples across these different nations, so. Okay, um, and do we have time for some questions from the audience now? Okay. And I'm wondering, because um, this is kind of an area of curiosity, I think, among the museum for those of us that work in contemporary art, um, is, you know, what is, what, is there a community of um, contemporary Native artists in Peru? You know, and if so, do you, are you, do you participate, you know, with, with those folks? Because it's really hard from here to see if that exists. I'd say it's, a, it, it's, it would be a very informal community if it does exist as a community. Um, I, I think there's probably a lot of unknown art, uh, artists that are, are working that are unknown to each other still. Um, <clears throat> because really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an economic thing. Like, 
you got to be a pretty fancy university to be teaching contemporary art, yeah? And most, most of the universities in Peru are the economic stratas, stratas don't really allow that. So, I mean, you have some people who, I mean, there's a lot of artists in Peru, a lot of really talented painters or, or um, you know, printmakers who work um, within, with native themes and are, who are native. But uh, about the contemporary thing is some of them have gone to, uh, you know, the few uh, grad program that exists in Arequipa and there is not a lot. There is not a lot because we're still very practical because um, a lot of us are very trapped in our technical capability. Um, so it's, uh, it's very interesting that way because, um, yeah, contemporary art is something that's kind of like the, the, the cream of the, the, the crop kind of thing. I hate to say it, but it's kind of true. And, and at the same time, I feel like contemporary art is a very natural extension of creativity um, to shape society. So I think it would be really important that there be more contemporary Native artists, and that's something I wanted to help out when I was uh, thinking of trying to get my, I was thinking that I could teach down there with, a, um, with just a bachelor's degree in fine art, but um, you know, the, the government has a lot of bureaucracy, so I wasn't able to do that. Um, so this program is a big chance for me to kind of push their boundaries a little bit. There's, there's young artists who are Native who are just kind of wondering what to do and you know they're like 20 something or 19 or 18 so I'm definitely going to get a hold of those guys and try and do a little bit of uh, brainwashing because um, I think there's a lot of room for them in the world and I, and I think that we need to be represented so I'm definitely going to encourage that as much as I can um, so I'd say it's a work in progress. Right on, thank you. Thank you. One more? If not? I'll ask one. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and this is for Imar as well. It's simply a question of your, your work with plastic bags as a material and, and where you are training other people to weave them as well. Uh, how much of this is a sort of protest against the degradation of uh, Peru's environment? And how much of it is just, you know, you're an artist finding a really neat new material to work with? Um, in my heart, it's both. Um, the frustration with the plastic bags and the trash going everywhere. Um, started when I was about 14 or 15 and learning to weave really, um, spending time in my community. And I remember once I went, you know, I have, I have spent a lot of years up here at that point. So I, I was hanging out with a friend. We went to a little, little adobe store on the, in the corner there and bought some crackers and we're walking along eating the crackers. So after we finished the crackers, my friend's like, well, thank you, because we always say thank you to everybody if, if we've eaten or something. So and then he throws the wrapper on the ground. I'm like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> and he's like, well, why not? And I'm like, well, you know, this is not, not biodegradable. Where is it going to go? And this and that. And he's like, well, where, am I, where, else, where else can I put it? You know, I was idealistic, and I was 14 or 15 years old. So then I was like, well, um, I don't know where you should put I mean, it was, there's nowhere for it to go. So... Yeah, it, it, it gets definitely some, some uh, frustration that's involved in this. Um, you know, about, about the idea that the free market economy brings all this uh, benefit and all this money and all these opportunities and all this stuff. But at the same time, you know, it brings the stuff, they ship it in from China or wherever to sell it to us. Um, but then they're not responsible with where are we going to put it afterwards. And so, and I, and you know, in my community and the festivals, I feel very strongly about that. The mayor, uh, we have a mayor, um, doesn't attend to this. So after every festival, there's a whole lot of, you know, refuse lying all over the place. And every year, it's more and more. And I'm like, so why don't you just put a can out there and tell? Because there's, because there's people that come specifically for those days of the festival to sell us things, candy wrappers, this, that, potato chips, you know. It's endless. Uh, and I'm like, well, why don't, it's a concept. Like if you're doing business, especially if you want to do business in an ecologically sensitive place and all this, and you're going to make money off of us, you know, why not spend 20 minutes after that and, and pick up your stuff and bring it back to the city where you brought it from? So it's, uh, for me, it's uh, really satisfi satisfying to have come up with my own strange way to pick up all the plastic or s some of the plastic and uh, you know, ship it back to where it came from. 
<laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the artists, and thank you to, to everyone here. Um, thank you. <laughs>